Hello and good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to say thank you to Orida for inviting me back. So I came here last year to speak, and it was an absolute pleasure. So I'm very happy to be back here uh, this week. So this talk kind of fits in with the, uh, the theme of the conference around sort of psyched and psychology. So we're going to be talking about hacking humans or social engineering. So my name's Stephen Haunts. I'm an independent trainer. So I go around lots of different conferences and companies doing talks around software development and kind of around sort of soft skills and social engineering. Uh, I'm also an author for Pluralsight. I've been doing that for the last five years. So if anyone here is a Pluralsight subscriber, you can listen to me droning on on Pluralsight. And I'm also a Microsoft MVP, but even though I'm an MVP, this is actually a non-technical talk, which is quite interesting. So that'd be interesting. How many people here are not software developers? One person at the back. OK, that's cool. So what I want to go through um, this afternoon is I'm going to talk a bit about what social engineering is. We're going to talk about a general framework for social engineering and kind of how it's done. And then we're going to look a bit about how you can kind of protect yourselves and your companies from social engineering attacks. And I've got some interesting uh, resources at the end. So if you are interested in this subject, you can go and read some extra books on it. First of all, a bit of a disclaimer. So social engineering generally leads to illegal activities, unless you're a penetration tester, in which case you're using your skills for good. Um, but you know, should anyone do some further research on this and then go and commit some crimes, you can't use me as evidence when you're being interviewed by the police. Because you know, generally when you do social engineering in a bad context, you might end up like this guy here behind bars, which is not what we're obviously trying to achieve. So this is an absolutely huge subject, and obviously we have 40 minutes to talk about this. So I can't cover everything about social engineering because it's literally one of those subjects that you could dedicate your life to learning. But what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the art of the, of the impossible. You know, what, what is it you can actually do and kind of how a social engineer goes about doing one of their attacks. So first of all, what is social engineering? Well, we can define it as an act of influencing someone to take an action that may not be in their best interest. So it's about you trying to get someone to do something which isn't going to be good for them, but it's going to be good for you. Now, typically, there's three uh, types of social engineering attack that you might encounter in the wild. So the first one is phishing, which is generally an email-based attack. Then we have vishing, which is very similar, but it's based on the telephone, where you get someone phoning you up, trying to extort money out of you in some way. And then the final one is impersonation, which is what we're going to spend a lot of our time talking about today. So first of all, a few statistics. So these statistics were taken from this link here on socialengineering.org, fantastic website, if you want to learn more about this subject. And the stats here are saying that with phishing, 90% of all email is spam. I think we can all agree with that. And if you see my inbox, it is mostly rubbish. Phishing represents about 77% of all social-based attacks. So when a lot of people, well, criminals go out and try to extort money from people, um, a lot of the time it's going to happen via email. And I'm sure you've all received the emails from Nigerian princes and or the typical uh, sextortion type scams which are going around these days at the moment where an attacker will claim that they've caught you doing something dodgy on your computer, like viewing porn, for example, and then try to get you to pay bitcoins to them. Otherwise, they're going to let everyone know about your so-called browsing habits. That's quite a common one at the moment. So clicking links and emails probably accounts for about 88% of all reported phishing attacks. So people not knowing any better going in and clicking links in emails. So phishing generally falls into different categories. You might have someone asking for help. You know, Nigerian prince, you know, who wants to pass on a load of money to you. It's them asking for help. Asking for donations for fake charities. Unfortunately, this one happens quite a lot, but when there's a natural disaster, like flooding or an earthquake, whilst you do get some legitimate charities trying to raise money, like the Red Cross, you do get a lot of um, fake so-called charities coming up trying to use your emotions to extort money out of you. Asking for information. So this is where people are trying to get, you know, access information into various different types of systems. Can very easily be um, targeted towards CEOs of companies. Asking for verification, so trying to get your banking details. If you receive an email that looks like it's from your bank, they try to get you to log on with your username and password. Where you know generally they're going to try and use those credentials to illicitly um, access one of your accounts. And you know. Uh, 
directly asking for login information. So phishing attacks these days tend to look very professional. So if you receive an email that's pretending to be from your bank, I mean, attackers these days go to quite a lot of trouble to make these emails look convincing. It's very easy to fool someone. They might be difficult with you know, technical people like us, but you know, my dad has fallen foul to some of his emails several times before, which is not good. So they'll use you know, original emails, uh, sorry, original logos, very convincing web design and CSS layouts, and they'll try and tell a compelling story to try and get you to access their illicit sites. So phishing emails will generally try and link to external references that come across as being legitimate. Uh, they might mention real names of successful people to lure, lure victims in. But they'll use a blend of real facts to cover their fake facts. So if you're looking at, say, a charity or a fake charity website, there'll be a lot of real content on there with some of their illicit content sort of sprinkled in between to make it seem more legitimate. So another common type of attack is a phishing attack. This is where someone tries to get you on the telephone. So the statistics from socialengineering.org, I mean, these are from 2012 and 2013, so they're quite old now, but they still kind of illustrate the point quite well. So 2.4 million customers were targeted for phone fraud, and these are US-based statistics. 2.3 customers targeted for phone fraud just in the first half of 2013 alone, so it's an ex exponential growth curve in these types of attacks. And they reckon for companies that are targeted by this in the US, they were losing on average $42,500 per attack or per account. So some examples of phishing attacks, you might get the uh, typical tax office scam, so you get someone posing to be from your local tax office, saying that you owe the company money, or you, well, you owe the government money. Uh, tech support scams. So my dad has also fallen foul to this one, where he's had some company phone him up, claiming that there's a virus on his machine, and for a small fee, they'll log on and try and remove it for you. I say people like, you know, technical people like us probably wouldn't fall for that, but non-technical people, you know, mums, dads, brothers, sisters, could quite easily fall for these scams. And also bank account fraud as well, so receiving fake calls from call centers um, claiming to be your bank. So generally people who do vision attacks have done their um, homework. We're going to cover this in a minute, but it's a technique called open source intelligence. And they'll use compelling voice and speech to try and sound convincing. So you know, they'll make it sound like they're actually calling from a real call center. And a lot of them, even though it might be just one person sitting in a room trying to call you, they'll actually have background ambience playing in the background to make it sound like they're actually calling from a call center. And you know, it's very convincing if ever you've heard any of these calls. Typically, the way they work on a vision attack is they're trying to use a sense of urgency to make, get you to make a decision quickly. So if you've got the tax office on the line saying that you owe, say, 10,000 euros to the tax office, I mean, that's going to get your heart rate going quite quickly. So that's a technique called fear then relief. So they scare you, then they try and offer you a relief. Well, you know, if you owe us £10,000, if you make an immediate payment of 1000 now, then we won't call you for a while. They're trying to get you using a sense of urgency to take action straight away. So the sense of urgency makes you act fast. It's a very, very convincing technique. Another one is impersonation. So the top place for identity theft is actually in the workplace. So attackers might actually target staff directly, or they might be looking for information that you throw away as a way to try and cause impersonation. So if you imagine you know, you're working for a company, you've got a design document for a piece of software that your project manager's handed you. When they hand you a new version, you, you can then actually just get the old version and throw it in the bin. To anyone who's trying to steal that information, even though it's an out-of-date document that has no value to you, to someone outside an organization, that's incredibly valuable, because they can get details about you know, the systems that you're building, design requirements, even bug reports. So typically, 80% of thefts involve disabling or bypassing controls. So if you imagine you get a call from someone in a call center who uh, you know, tries to get you to hand over your credentials, claiming to be someone from the actual company themselves, I mean, you're more likely to trust them if you think it's coming from inside the company. And one of the most valuable things that they're going to try and steal is personal data, because if you can tie any kind of information back to an actual living person, then that's actually very valuable. So different types of social engineer. There's lots of different types out there. So you have your stereotypical hoodie-wearing hackers, he says, standing here in a hoodie. 
penetration testers, so these are people that are you know, generally employed by companies to try and break into systems. Part of what they do is trying to infiltrate networks and sort of the more technical, clever hacks. But part of what they're doing as well is trying to social engineer members of the staff. Now, you've got your typical spies and people who work for governments, just like what we see in James Bond films. Identity thieves, disgruntled employees. This is a very, very big threat to companies. So if you leave your company on bad terms, what's to stop you from stealing a bit of information before you go or stealing source code? Disgruntled employees is probably one of the biggest threats that a company might face if you leave a company on bad terms. A class recruiters as social engineers as well. I hope there's no recruiters in the room. But typically, you know, unless you're actually actively looking for a job, they are trying to get you to sign up to go for interviews. And we've got governments and salespeople and other such um, types of employment. But can anyone think of who some of the best social engineers are that we might encounter day to day? Sales, yeah? Kids. kids. <laughs> Especially my kids. My daughter can wrap me around her little finger and get me to do pretty much anything. That's not my daughter, that's just a stock image. But yeah, children are very, very effective at getting you to do things. So why do people do it? Why do people go to all this hassle? Because it is a lot of hassle trying to do an, like an impersonation attack, and we'll go through the process in a moment. But it consistently works. If you're targeting a huge number of people, and you come across as convincing, it's very easy to get someone to do something they're not supposed to do. It's human nature. As bad as it sounds, people are the biggest vulnerability to any network. So the more people your company employs, the bigger the threat they face, because people do make mistakes. They can give up information without, without thinking about it. And it also offers a path to least resistance. So if you can get someone to give you your password, that might be easier than going through like a big sort of network penetration test. So common types of attacks, customer service staff, delivery staff, so someone turning up at your company wearing a convincing brown UPS uniform with a parcel under their arm. Receptionist is probably going to let them in. Phone calls and tech support all very sort of common attack vectors which people try to use to get information out of you. So that's kind of some of the background information about what social engineering is, but what are the techniques that people use? So typically there's a four-stage process that a social engineer or an impersonator is going to try and go through. So we've got information gathering, pretexting, elicitation and manipulation. So let's go through each one in turn. So the first one is information gathering. It's a posh, correct term, it's open source intelligence, which sounds a bit more spy-like. Or, or it's sometimes called OSINT. So a social engineering tag takes a lot of um, preparation. You're not just going to go and try and manipulate someone without doing your homework first. And this requires a lot of gathering of information. Now, there's lots of different ways of doing it. One of the most common is dumpster diving or literally going through someone's bins. Now, whether it's a company or an individual, you'll be surprised at how much information gets thrown away without even thinking about it. So we use the example of a design document for a system. It might have no intrinsic value to you if you feel that document's out of date, but someone outside the company, that's incredibly valuable. If you think about your own bins at home, think about what you throw away and wh what kind of information that gives about you. So if you throw away medicine bottles, that kind of gives an indication about any kind of illnesses that you might have. Um, if you throw away a lot of alcohol bottles, like you know, recycling bins full of whiskey bottles, that might say something about your uh, pastimes. And that can all be used as a way of manipulating you further down the line. The internet is a great way of getting information out of someone. I, mean, I read somewhere that the CIA used to joke that they don't really need to go spying on people because you just give them all the information for free. So if you look at what's on Facebook, what you might typically post, especially if you post it as a public post, Twitter, again, you can get lots of information about someone's um, psyche, you know, how they think, how they operate. Political biases, you know, these are things that people tend to tweet about quite a lot, so you know, regardless of what political party you support, you might post a tweet about it. LinkedIn, I mean, this is a big one, LinkedIn. I mean, think of all the information you put on there. You know, it's, it's basically an online CV or resume, but you've got all the companies that you've worked for in the past. You've probably put details about the projects that you've worked on because you want to sell yourself. By clicking on the company, you can see who all your co-workers are. So you can actually build up a really valuable map of where you work, who you work with, and what you've worked on, which is very, very valuable. 
Again, to us, it might not seem like it's that valuable, but to someone who's trying to get information on you, you can get loads of information out of that. Especially if you use kind of common lingo that's used within your company, you know, sort of project terms. Google and Bing as well, if anyone uses Bing. But search engines are another great way of getting information about people. You know, just type someone's name in, you know, you'd be surprised what you get back. So that's using social media. Another form is by getting people to install malware on their machines, which is easier, well, it can be quite easy to do. So if you see a 512 gigabyte USB stick on the floor, you might think it's Christmas. You know, it's still fairly expensive. So you might pick it up and plug it into your machine. Before you know it, you've had a remote access keylogger installed on your machine, which is recording your key presses. Um, another common one is screenshotting tools. So silently, you're having screenshots taken of what's on your screen at any particular time. That can be easily compressed and sent off to a server somewhere. So if you work in, say, sales and accounts, you could have quite uh, valuable sales or financial data about your company. If people were using their work machines for personal email, you can probably get some interesting emails from that as well. Another very common one is shoulder surfing, literally just looking over someone's shoulder. Now I see examples of this all the time. I used to, before I went freelance, I used to commute to work on the train every day. And every now and again, you see someone working on their laptop or typing on their phone. All you need to do is just look over the seat and you can read what they're doing. Again, it's a very valuable way or a very easy way of getting information. Of course, there are some mitigations against this. You can buy what's called a privacy scarf. <laughs> so if uh, you're ever trying to get your grandma to knit you something for Christmas, this might be a good one. Another really effective way of getting information is by hanging out in bars and just listening to what people are doing. So I was hired by a fairly large bank in the UK to do a version of this talk. It was more of a, it was a two hour version, so it was more of a sort of mini workshop. And when I sort of talked to HR about it, we agreed that I'll go down to where the bank was sited on Canary Wharf in London. I'll go down two days early and I'll just spend a bit of time hanging around in bars. So I knew roughly what time people went for lunch and what time they finished work. So I'll just hang around in a bar having a drink, having some dinner. You spot people wearing the, uh, the ID cards for that badge, so I kind of position myself so I'm sitting fairly close to them so I can overhear conversations, and I just started writing down information. If I could read their names on the badges, I wrote the names down. If they were talking about projects, I made note of that. Sometimes they're having a go at their boss, you know, talking about their boss behind their backs, we've all done it. Then when I delivered the talk and sort of got to this slide, I just sort of brought up another slide of, uh, you know, all these different people that have been out in the bar that day. Photos as well, I was discreetly taking photos. All with the permission of the bank, I might add. You'd be surprised, you know, just how easy it is to be very loose-lipped when you're out in a bar with your colleagues. If you've had a particularly bad day, your boss has made you do something you don't want to do, you know, you might just shoot the breeze with your colleagues and, you know, talk about them. Or if a deployment has gone particularly bad with a project, you might discuss about how much of a bad day you've had. All very valuable information. Okay, so let's assume that you've gone through this process, you spent months gathering information. It's not a quick process, but you spend a lot of time gathering information. You now want to move on to the next step, which is pretexting. So pretexting is the practice of presenting oneself as someone else in order to obtain information. In other words, it's known as acting. You're putting on a persona to try and convince someone that you are someone else. So some basic principles of pretexting. So obviously the more planning and research you do is going to lead to more success. That's why the information gathering stage is so vital. If you can find out interests of the people that you're targeting, so if they support a particular football team or they have particular hobbies that you find out about, maybe because you've been through their bins and you found copies of Railway Magazine or whatever in their bin, you can use that as a way of building up a rapport with someone. So if you just edge yourself into a bar, standing next to a bar, you can quite easily strike up a conversation if you're fairly confident. And you can use that kind of shared interest as a way of building up that rapport, talking to them for several hours, you know, maybe meeting them a few days down the line, and sort of continuing your conversation. You spend that time building up trust with the person, and then they're probably more likely to give you information about what they do at work. So good acting definitely helps. I'd be absolutely rubbish at this as someone who's quite introverted. I'm not the sort of person to go up talking to someone in a bar, 
but lots of people are quite good at this. So generally you want to keep it simple, so you don't want to try and use too much information that gives away your uh, pretext. And you want to use information that requires no verification. So you don't want to say something that then someone's then going to go and question, which you don't have the answer to. Obviously, planning is the name of the game. So you want to make sure you have a definite aim of what it is you're trying to get out of that person. So if you're part of a criminal gang and you're trying to do a coordinated attack against the company, you're probably going to have up, you know, a bunch of you targeting different people to try and get different things. So you might want to try and get the names of servers. Uh, I worked for one online bank years ago, and we had a, a period of time where someone kept on phoning in from outside, pretending to be someone from the IT support team. Now, the company was huge. It was like you know, 20,000 people worked there. So you get someone phoning up, very convincing, talking about particular servers, but they're trying to get information about some different servers. And they were doing that all around the department. Luckily, because we'd had quite a good bit of training about social engineering, we kind of spotted the patterns and managed to put a stop to it. But imagine how convincing it is. You know, Imagine the uh, chief financial officer or someone from accounts phones you up in a large corporation. You're not necessarily going to know who they are because the company's so big. Now, sometimes with pretexting, just being friendly will be sufficient. You know, if you've had a particularly bad day and then someone's just nice to you in a bar, you know, that's probably going to work. So another definition of social engineering, then, is the clever manipulation of the natural human tendency to trust with trust being the key word there. You're trying to build up trust with someone so that you can then go and get some information from them. So once you've done that pretext and you've kind of built up some trust, you've built up some rapport with someone, you might actually befriend these people and be friends with them for months before you actually try and go in for what you're looking for. So the next step is elicitation. So elicitation is the act of getting information without directly asking for it. So if someone comes up to you and says, oh, what's the name of the servers that you're microservices are installed on. That's very direct. That's going to raise a red flag. So the key here is trying to get information out of someone without actually directly asking for it, which, is, which sounds quite hard, and it is. So what you're going to try and do is you're going to try and exploit someone's human nature. So by that we mean, you know, most people want to be polite. I mean, you do get douchebags, but generally people want to be polite and nice to everyone else. People want to appear well informed. So if you're asking someone about something, feel how bad it is when someone asks you a question, you say you don't know the answer to it. It makes you kind of feel a bit, a bit awkward or a bit bad. So people want to feel well informed. So if they've got someone asking you questions, they might be more sort of keen to give you a valid answer because they want to appear like they know what they're talking about. Also, people want to be appreciated. If someone gives you some information, you give them you know, a pat on the back and say thank you very much. We like that. We're social creatures. We like to feel appreciated. And generally, honest people don't like to lie or withhold information. I like to think, you know, I like to have a good positive outlook on humanity. Generally, people are quite nice and want to be nice and not lie to us. So you can use that to your advantage. So to succeed at this, it's all about understanding how to communicate with people. So it's obviously very easy to put it as a bullet point on a slide. This is the sort of thing that can take years and years of practice. Um, something else that you might need to do is adapt your communication styles to fit a situation. So your elicitation could be going quite well until you accidentally slip up and say something wrong, in which case you're going to have to adapt your style to try and sort of backpedal and get the person to carry on trusting you. I read one um, article once about someone who's doing a pretext. It was a man trying to uh, basically coerce a woman to give him some information. And he made one mistake one day where he actually turned up with his wedding ring on. So he forgot to take the wedding ring off. As you can imagine, if someone spots that, that's going to open up some other questions. So it's all about building a bond with your target. And it's also very important to stay in character. So I said, you know, the example of the wedding ring. If you're trying to come across as your pretext as someone who's single, but then suddenly you turn up and you've got your wedding ring on, that could be slightly awkward. And it's also about the effective use of questioning techniques. So typically, there's three types of questions that you can ask people. So we've got open, closed, and leading questions. And they can all be used for various different ways of steering a conversation. So an open-ended question is a way of getting a full meaningful answer from someone. So if I was to say to you, tell me about the relationship with your father, you know, that leaves it quite open for you to answer. Oh, relationship with my dad's pretty good. 
oh no, it's been a bit strained, I've not really spoken to him for a couple of years. You, know, you can get quite a lot of information. How do you feel about an election candidate? Again, it's a very open question, so someone could say, oh yes, I completely support Donald Trump, or someone could say, oh, I think Donald Trump's an idiot. It gives you, you know, quite a lot of leverage, or quite a lot of uh, ways of answering in different ways. On the flip side to that, you've got closed questions. These are typically questions that might ask for like, like a yes or no answer. So, using the similar questions to before, so do you get on with your father? That's quite close. Yes, I do. No, I don't. Who are you going to vote for? Again, it's a very limited set of answers that you can give. And then we have what are called leading questions, where you're trying to subtly prompt someone to answer in a particular way. So if I was to say to you, do you have any problems with your boss? Some kind of trigger words in there with problems and boss. It's kind of directing you to think about, well, actually, do I have a problem with my boss? Generally not, but actually, I don't like the way he makes a cup of tea. It kind of forces you to, or coerces you to think in a different way. Or the next one, how fast was the red car going when it smashed into the blue car? So that's kind of planting a seed in your mind that actually it was a red car that was at fault, and actually it could have been the blue car. So it's a way of sort of subtly pushing someone in a certain direction. Now when you're doing an elicitation, you're typically going to do this as a funnel, so you might start off with very open questions. Then as you start narrowing down in the information that you're trying to get, you'll go more closed, and then if necessary, you'll use a leading question to try and divert someone into a particular way of answering. Okay, so we've talked about pre-texting, which is taking on a persona. And then we've talked about elicitation, which is using that persona to extract information. And obviously, we've covered that quite quickly. As I said before, this is stuff that can take years and years and years for someone to master the art of. But I think it's quite interesting, sort of thinking about how people go about this. Okay, so the next part then is manipulation. And this is kind of where it starts getting a bit more, a bit more nasty. So typically, when you're talking about interacting with people, there's a, a fine line between manipulation and influencing. So influencing someone is trying to get someone to change their mind in a way that's good for them. So if you've been out with your friends drinking and you know your friend's got his car keys on them, you're going to try and influence them to, you know, give me the car keys so you don't drive home. That's, that's an example of influencing. Manipulation is influencing someone to change their mind in a way that is not good for them. So generally that means influencing is looking for a win-win outcome, so it's a win for both of you. Whereas manipulation is a win-lose outcome, so it's a win for you as the social engineer, but it's a lose for the person that you're talking to. So manipulation is generally bad, it's not nice, it's not the sort of thing we want to do to people, but for a social engineer it's good, it's your bread and butter, it's all about manipulation. So manipulation is the act of influencing someone to take an action that may not be in their best interest. In other words, it's the act of manipulation. Now, there's probably thousands and thousands of manipulation techniques, but we'll go through some of the more common ones. So the first one is fear, or commonly called the fear then relief technique. So you're using the initial fear as a tactic and then offering immediate relief to that fear. So for example, hello, this is technical support. We've detected a virus on your machine that could lock all your files. We need to install a virus killer or malware protector immediately. Can you please confirm your password so that we can identify you so we can log on and remove the virus? Now, to an unsuspecting person who doesn't work in IT and you receive that call from your IT support department, that's probably going to put the fear of God up you because you don't want to lose all your work. Guilt is another way of getting someone to comply. So do someone a favor and then use it against them later. Or you can use any secrets that you find out someone as blackmail. So I need you to copy these files for me, help me, or I'll tell your wife, husband, partner, or boss about your affair, drinking, or drugs problem. Again, if they've gone through your bins and found 30 whiskey bottles in there, they probably know that you might have a drinking problem. Another technique is called foot in the door. So this is where you get a victim to comply with a very small request first before you actually go in for your main request. So a typical one, if you have like a, a beggar or a homeless person on the street who's, who wants you to give them some money, they might stop you and ask you the time first. So they're getting you to comply with a simple request. And then they're asking you for their actual, what it is they actually want. Door-to-door uh, -door sales people can you know, knock on your door. They can strike up a conversation with you. Oh, isn't the weather nice today? Oh, yes, it's great. Well, it's not today. 
But then once they've got you talking, they can then, you know, they've got you. They can then go and ask you further questions. So that's kind of a, a basic technique or series of techniques or a pipeline, I guess, of what a social engineer is going to go through. So information gathering, pretexting, elicitation, and manipulation. So obviously we've covered that quite quickly, but that's kind of a very general framework or list of steps that someone's going to go through. So what can we do as people and uh, corporations to protect ourselves? Well, actually, a lot of the prevention techniques are very straightforward. A lot of them are common sense, which is good. So let's go through some personal mitigation attacks for you as an individual. So common targets in an organization could be junior staff. Imagine you've got an intern or a recent graduate who started at the company, very, very eager to please. You know, they want to improve their careers and work their way up the ladder. So they're very, very good people to target. So as an organization, you need to be very aware of all the junior staff that you have in your organization and make sure they receive appropriate training. Contractors as well may not necessarily have the same level of vested interest in the company as what a full-time member of staff has. So they could be a good target. Administration staff, you know, non-technical people. And also support staff. So if you have anyone try to ask you for information in the company, the first thing you want to do is ask them for identification. If someone calls you on, the, on a company phone line, first of all, you want to, you know, ask them for their identity, and then most companies these days have some kind of like online register on the internet where you can go and look up people. You want to try and verify who they are, and then say you'll call them back, and then try to call them back on the number that's registered on your intranet. Another one is watching for out-of-character questions. If someone asks you something that feels a bit weird, normally your gut instinct will tell you if a question seems a bit strange. In that case, if your gut instinct says, well, that's a bit weird, just don't answer. Nobody's going to fault you for not answering a question. Then maybe you want to go talk to, you know, the security staff or your manager and sort of tell them about the request. They might be a perfectly valid request, but if it feels strange, it's perfectly fine not to answer. Another one. So if people give loads of information before giving a small request, is a warning sign. So if you're trying to coerce someone to do something on the phone, but you then end up giving a massive backstory and just keep talking when really you're just asking something that could be quite simple. The fact that they're talking so much and maybe trying to distract you while you're working on the phone is also a warning sign. Another one, don't let guests roam free in a building. So it seems like common sense, but as I said before, if you have a delivery person turn up with a parcel under their arm, receptionist lets them in, they say, oh, I need to go drop this off to Fred whoever, and then they just let them go and walk off around the building. That's a very bad thing to do. They could be trying to access server rooms, they could be trying to steal documents, or maybe even dropping USB sticks around the office. So if someone comes into your building and you don't recognize them, you know, make them sign in, offer to chaperone them around the building. If they say they want to see a particular person, take them to see that person directly. So we talked about this already, but USB thumb drives are catastrophic to organizations, to the point where a lot of companies I've worked to actually physically disable USB ports on computers for this very reason. It's very easy to plug a, a drive in and have some software remote installed onto your machine. Another one, be aware of what you're saying. So I gave the example about people in bars, you know, being very loose lips, just, you know, blowing off some steam talking about their day. You know, everyone goes out for drinks with their colleagues, that's absolutely fine, but you need to be very aware of what you're actually saying and who's around you at the time. So, you know, by all means, talk about the weather, talk about the football or whatnot, but don't talk about internal workings of your company or struggles on a project, because you never know who's listening. So a good technique for just anyone generally is to shred documents, whether at home or in the office. So if you have a bank statement, you no longer want it, don't just throw it in the bin. Shred it first. You can buy shredders very, very cheaply these days. You'd be surprised that what seems like very innocent information is very telling to someone who's doing a social engineering attack. So always make sure you shred any documents, uh, prescriptions for drugs, credit card statements, anything. Don't store confidential documents on a USB thumb drive. I mean, do you know how easy those things are to lose? 
especially the cheaper ones where you've got like, the little plastic clips on them, they break all the time, then before you know it, when you're taking your keys out of your pocket, you've dropped a, a thumb drive on the floor. If you've copied important documents or personal documents or accounts onto that thumb drive, that could be very valuable. Enabling drive encryption on your laptop, so regardless of whether you're a Windows or a Mac user, both of those systems have ways of encrypting the hard drives, and it's a very good thing to make sure you have that turned on. Um, not so long ago, there was a, a news story in the UK about some government officials or members of parliament losing their laptops on trains. So you can imagine the sort of information that's on that, especially while we're going through Brexit. You can imagine the sort of information that could be on there. Be aware of who's looking over your shoulder. So does anyone here commute to work on a train or public transport? How many of you people will try and get a bit of work done while you're on the train? Include it as part of your work day. So, you know, that's fine. I used to do that all the time. But you need to be aware of who's sitting around you. So if someone's sitting behind you and you're working on some code for a system or some documents, who's reading that? Is that stuff you should really be doing on the, on the train? Obviously, lock in your machine when you step away from your desk. The amount of people that don't do that. We used to have this bit of a practical joke in a company I worked at where we'd just go and change someone's uh, desktop background to something slightly embarrassing, or you rickroll them because they left their machines unlocked. But you know, if you don't lock your machine when you go away, you also stop someone just sitting down and you know, opening up your emails, or even sending a joke email to all your colleagues. And obviously, educating yourself. So talks like this, some of the resources I'll show you at the end of the talk are very, very valuable and very interesting as well. So corporate mitigation techniques. This is more what a company should be doing. And if a company's not doing any of these, you might want to go and suggest it to your security officers. So the first one is identifying what information assets are most valuable. So it's all about marking documents. And a very easy way, or very common technique, is to put color codes on the beginning or on the front page of documents. So you might have a little green badge, which means this is okay to release. It could be a sales brochure. If it gets into the public domain, that's not a problem. Amber or yellow could be release only with authorization. And red, obviously confidential, do not release. Very, very simple technique, but it makes it very obvious when you look at a document what you can or can't do with that document. So writing corporate security policy documents. Now, I know everyone loves reading these things when they get sent to us. But actually, for an organization, they're very important. But just because a company's written a corporate security document, just relying on your staff reading it, I mean, who's, who, has anyone ever actually read all of their security policy documents from start to finish? Oh, one person over here. OK, and over there. <laughs> Bravo. It's very important for a company to actually do sort of follow-up training on this. Now, it's, you know, I've worked for organizations where they make us do quarterly um, like little online tests that you have to do to prove that you know the details are in those documents. It's a mas massive pain in the ass. Nobody likes doing it, but it is important because it tells you what you can and can't do with certain assets within your company. If your company hasn't got any of these, then website here at sans.org has some templates which you can use as a starting point. So even if you work for a small startup and there's only a handful of you, it, is useful to put one of these together. So keeping software updated and patched religiously, easier said than done in some organizations, but zero day exploits against older operating systems or versions of Office are real, they're in the wild. People can use them to exploit uh, vulnerabilities in companies. That's why it's always important to keep your software uh, continuously updated. There was an issue uh, with the National Health Service in the UK, where someone managed to get some of the ransomware software into some hospitals on the NHS because they were still running really old versions of Windows XP because they hadn't upgraded all their software. Now, in some cases, that was hard for them to do because they had some MRI scanners and the computer software to control them only ran on XP. So there were some caveats where they couldn't easily upgrade without spending half a million pounds on a new machine. But as a general rule, you do want to try and make sure that all of your software is patched. Next one is uh, setting up a document destroying service. Again, going back to the idea of shredding, shredding documents. Any company really should have some kind of document destroying service. We have the confidential waste bins that you put documents in. Then they're you know, taken to a lorry on site and shredded or sent to an incinerator. So never assume that your company is too small to be a target. Sometimes smaller companies are easier to get information from. 
So don't always assume that you know no one is going to affect our company because we're only a startup. That's just not the case. If you have anything that can be perceived as having intrinsic value to someone, then you could be a target. Okay, so very quick summary. So social engineering is the act of influencing someone to take an action that may not be within their best interest. We looked at some different examples of you know, where social engineering can happen. Obviously, children is a quite a common one in the, in the house. People do it because it consistently works. It's very easy if you're, if you've got very good like charisma. It's very easy to get information out of people by just being nice and putting on a good pretext. People, unfortunately, are the biggest vulnerability to any network. That sounds a bit harsh and a bit horrible, but sadly, it is true. People are the biggest leak. Um, an example: a company I worked at, uh, a guy was being made redundant. Um, he was an IT ops engineer. Now, the database that we were using had, you know, at rest encryption on it, but there was nothing stopping him, which he actually did, going into the database, select starring all of the data from key tables, and then just pasting it into an Excel file, and then taking it out of the company with him. So, you know, at rest encryption didn't help there. You know, it's a path of least resistance. Doing a hack against a network is incredibly complicated. Doing a hack against a person, if you've got the charisma to do it, is very easy. So we walk through the basic setup then. So information gathering, it's all about getting information on your target. Pretexting is you putting on a persona, it's you acting, pretending to be someone that you're not. Elicitation is using that persona to extract information from someone without directly asking for it. And we also talked about some very sort of high level manipulation techniques. Now there's probably thousands and thousands of manipulation techniques. But you know, fear and relief is probably one of the most common ones. And then we finished up by looking at some personal and corporate mitigation techniques, which I hope you'll all agree, a lot of them are common sense. But sometimes it's common sense where we fall down as humans. So some resources if you're interested in this. So I've got a version of this talk done as a sort of a, a two-way chat um, course on Pluralsight. That's there if anyone wants to go and view it. Some really interesting books here, uh, written by Kevin Mitnick. So The Art of Deception, The Art of Intrusion are two very interesting manuals about how a lot of this stuff's done. And also Ghost in the Wires is a biography of Kevin Mitnick because he was one of the FBI's most wanted felons at one point. Although now he's a reformed character and he runs a software security consultancy helping companies protect themselves from people like him. If you're really interested in this technique, then I recommend this book here. So Social Engineering, The Art of Human Hacking. Now this book's massive, it's like a big thousand page book and it goes into a lot of detail on a lot of the techniques and how they're done and how to put on personas and how to manipulate people. Very, very fascinating read. I read it once on holiday, my wife was horrified. <laughs> I was sitting there reading this massive book by the pool. Something we didn't get to touch on was um, body language, um, but how you convey yourself via nonverbal cues is very important. And there's a book here called What Everybody Is Saying by an ex-FBI um, interrogator called Joe Navarro. Absolutely fascinating book. You can tell a lot about someone just by how they're acting or how they're sitting. So if someone's sitting in an interview, for example, and their legs and feet are directed towards the door, it means they're uncomfortable and they want to make a quick escape. If someone's rubbing their hands a lot, you know, doing this, that means they're nervous. If someone's sitting there steepling, you know, just on a desk doing that with their hands, it means they're confident. Thousands of techniques like that. It's a really good book. So with that, we've gone back a few minutes over, but thank you very much for coming this afternoon. Thank you.